Hello, welcome back. It's Bookwormy and Valerie Monroe. Thank you, Bookwormy, for introducing us. We are going to get back to reading Journey to Nagwanis, and today we're going to read half of chapter 20 because it's quite long. Tell them what it's called. It's called A Magical Gift Proves Extremely Useful. And if you remember last time, Brogdon and John had kind of parted ways. Um, Brogdon is now on his way home. John had set off. Oh, here's my cat Poe saying hello. Here's his tail. He's sort of walking all over my desk right now. Um, John had taken off for Sunset Island after, hello Poe, after the Sasquatch had supposedly sank in the water. And Brogdon is quite upset about it. He's upset that John let this happen to the Sasquatch and he's headed for home. So let's continue on. Just got to keep Poe's tail out of the way. Brogdon was exhausted and filled with sorrow, but he knew he had to continue his journey back. He longed to break into a run and skip over the rocks that he encountered on the bridle path, anything to shorten the return trip. However, his achy body rebelled against the idea. So he leaned forward, jutted his lip out, and forced his weary bones to trudge ahead in the dusk. Hello, Poe. I guess he wants to read with us today. The gravel crunched beneath him and the gritty sound reassured him that with every determined step, he was closer to home. He couldn't wait to reunite with his aunts, who were most likely in the full throes of harvest day preparations. The holiday was just a few days off now. The positions of the stars, the feel and smell of the air, the bare branches, and the last V's of southbound geese all served as an accurate calendar. But even though the thought of embracing his aunts and saving the harvest, savoring the harvest day dinner would not deter him from what he had promised to do before he returned home. He had to deliver the news to Finley's wife that her husband was alive and that the Amber Rose had been delivered. Some people know how to keep their word, he thought grimly. He's very upset at John. It seemed like years had passed since Finley's wife pleaded with him in the eagle's nest that day. As long as a glimmer of hope remains, you must, must search for them. It remains in your hands. You must find the amber rose and bring Finley safely home. He felt a huge sense of pride and accomplishment. Although Finley wasn't technically with him at the moment, he was positive that the gnome would show up eventually. At least his wife could rest easy knowing that her husband was alive. At least that much has been done. Brogdon hiked along the bridle path until he was staggering and his legs could no longer support him. What must have been a lush expanse of velvety green grass in the summer was now a shortly clipped brown carpet. He spied a small metal glider that faced the shadowy lake. The house dwellers probably reclined there in the warmer weather probably to watch a bevy of swans glide by. Fortunately, no one had removed the glider's cushions, so Brogdon was able to stretch out comfortably. It took a little effort on his part to get the glider moving, but then momentum kept it rocking back and forth. His eyelids grew heavy, and although he tried to push all horrible thoughts from his mind, that awful scene with the drowning Sasquatch kept repeating itself. Thankfully, the motion of the glider lulled him into sleep. The moon cast its gentle glow over him, and then as the night wore on, low clouds crawled in, and a breeze danced across the lake and through the trees. It shook a remain number of remaining leaves off their branches and sent the ones already on the ground skittering in circles. Brogdon curled up into a ball to keep himself warm. Fatigue triumphed over the coldness, and he slept soundly. When he awoke three days later, I'm sorry, three hours later, that would have been a long sleep, right? Three days. When he awoke three hours later, the pain of the previous day's events still sat heavy in his heart. The first thought he had was again of the Sasquatch disappearing under the water. So he pushed those awful images away and focused on his duty. After hopping down from the glider, he stretched his arms above his head, wiggled his fingertips, and then bent and touched his fingertips to his toes ten times to get his blood flowing. 
After wiping two tiny kernels of sleep from his eyes, he made his way back toward the bridle path. There was a row of hedges on his right, and he paused to pull out a long white string from its evergreen branches. It seemed to be a forgotten kite string. Once he freed it, he then stretched it out, doubled it, and used it to tie his long hair into a ponytail. With his face open to the morning air, he was ready to set off. His plan was to continue along the bridle path until he reached the point where the swale emptied into the lake. Once there, the most grueling part of the return journey would begin. He would have to climb upward along the bank of the swale and scale the willow's trunk. Because remember, that's where that eagle nest is, where Finley's wife is. There were several other swales on this side of the lake, and each one concluded with a waterfall spilling from a large cement drain pipe. As Brogdon came to each, he stuck his head in to listen, smell, and gaze upward. He was confident that he would recognize his swale. The first drain pipe that he came upon was clogged with a pile of leaves and dried out needles. There was hardly any water passing through it. The next few drain pipes were unremarkable, except for collections of stones that remained immovable as water flowed by. It would take hundreds of years of passing water to prod them, inch by inch, to the mouth of the drain pipe, where they would at last drop into the lake below. Late in the afternoon, just as the sun was getting ready to make its final descent for the day, Brogdon let out a whoop of joy as he recognized the drain pipe that led to his swale. He crawled onto the top of the pipe and laid down to rest with a sheik flat against the concrete. Forty winks, he decided. Forty winks and I'll get my second wind and then I can be on my way. He closed his eyes and began to count down from forty. Before he reached thirty, he was sleeping soundly. Two chipmunks carrying nuts in their mouths scampered along the drain pipe and paused to look curiously at him before disappearing over the other side. Then a cardinal landed next to him. It lingered for only a moment before flying away. His nap would have continued except that a leaf landed on his face. And as he inhaled, the edge of the leaf tickled his nose and he awoke with a sneeze. He looked around with a start. He was shivering in the duskiness and his cheek was marked with indentations from where it had rested on the concrete. A wave of confusion swept through him. He had pictured himself heading up the hill and reaching the eagle's nest in the daylight. Now he would have to make his way in the dark. He stood up, stretched, and prepared to leave when he heard a tinkling sound, tinny tones on various notes of the musical scale. It seemed to be coming from underneath him. He crawled along the top of the drain pipe until it reached his end, its end, and lying on his stomach, he stretched out and peered into the pipe. A dainty fairy was sitting at the pipe's opening, her legs dangling over the side. The tiniest of flowers adorned her pale brown pixie cut. Her whispery azure dress shimmered with dozens of minuscule sparkles and a pair of violet wings that matched her eyes floated out behind her. She wore no shoes. And Brogdon realized the two ribbons tied around her ankles were the source of the music he'd heard. Small bells were attached to the ribbons, and every time she swung her legs, the chiming rang out and echoed inside the pipe. Sensing Brogdon's presence, the fairy glanced upward, smiled broadly, and gave a high-pitched squeal of delight. Oh, you're here! You've arrived at last, she cried, clapping her petite hands together. Brogdon continued to peer at her from his upside-down position. Do you mean me, he asked. Why, of course, she replied gleefully. You are Brogdon, are you not? He swung down and sat next to her. She couldn't have been larger than a firefly. Picture how small that is. How did you know, he asked. Why, your aunts, of course. They sent me to wait. They sent me to wait for you. Aunt Gladys provided the description. A foot-tall boy with a long mop of brown hair. Aunt Hazel gave me a list of possible places where I could find you. I've been waiting here for you for a few nights, she smiled. My name is Nixie. Your aunts will be so pleased to know you're safe. I can accompany you home, or if you prefer, I can fly on ahead and give them the news. 
She swung her legs and fluttered her wings, and the drain pipe echoed with a twinkly, unearthly sound. Please do not think that I'm ungrateful, replied Brogdon. I appreciate you looking for me, and I hope I haven't caused my aunts to worry too much. But I can't return home right now. Nixie's tiny brows furrowed with concern. I must make a stop on the way as a favor to a friend, he went on apologetically. Once I've delivered a message, I will return home straight away. Nixie nodded. I understand. Now, if you excuse me, I need to stretch my wings. She stood up and flew around the outside of the drain pipe for a few moments. It's been awfully damp in here. Brogdon gazed upon her beating wings and thought that she looked like a hummingbird. If only he had wings, he thought wistfully. It must be wonderful, he said, you know, being able to fly. Oh, it is, Nixie beamed and twirled in a loop to emphasize her point. It's the most fun you can have. Well, yes, of course, but I was thinking more along the lines of efficiency, getting somewhere quickly. He looked down forlornly at his feet. It's going to be such a long hike up that hill, along the swale, and then back up the willow tree. Nixie zoomed in a circle around Brogdon and then hovered in front of his face. The bells on her ankles jingled merrily. I've got the most brilliant idea, she exclaimed. You do need wings. Sure, and you just happen to have an extra pair hanging around, laughed Brogdon. Well, no, that would be silly. No fairy needs two pairs of wings. What I do happen is to have a smidge of dust. It's all I have left, but it's probably just enough to do the trick. The trick? I have enough dust to grant your wish. If wings are what you desire, that is. But then you won't have any dust left, he pointed out. What if you need it? Nixie smiled sweetly. The dust isn't for me. It's for helping others. I think it's the best part of being a fairy, making wishes come true. I've got to give the rest of it away before the year's end. So it works out perfectly. She pulled out a thin silver cord from around her neck. It held the teeniest bottle he'd ever seen. A tiny cork stopper ensured that the silver sparkles did not accidentally spill out. She uncorked the bottle and began to tip it over. Wait, Brogdon said, holding up his hand to stop her. And that's where we'll stop for today. When we come back tomorrow, we're going to find out if Brogdon has wings. I think that would be really cool to have wings. I think it would be too. What about you? Do you think it would be really fun to fly? And where would you go if you could fly? Please come back and join us again tomorrow for more of Journey to Naguanas.